Hello, everyone, and welcome to. This is Asia, and here's Indonesia. Now let's go, shall we? Indonesia is a hulking tropical archipelago, brimming with volcanoes and rainforest and marvelous creatures. A land of typhoons and monsoons, and over 17,000 islands and islets. The most populated being Java. That's Sumatra. That's Sulawesi. That's Bali. And as you see, Indonesia shares Borneo, New Guinea, and Timor with other states. Now this gargantuan assortment of equatorial isles was never unified into a single sovereign state until until fairly recently. Before that, its variegated segments were as separated as its hundreds of different languages. Indonesia's prehistory is a fossilized conundrum, but things get more discernible with the arrival many millennia ago of the Melanesians, who hunted and hand-printed their way through the jungle. Their descendants today dwell in the nation's east, but the country's ethnic majority spring from the Austronesians, who set sail from Taiwan and arrived first in Sulawesi, and then, around the time the Egyptians were assembling the Great Pyramid, disembarked on Java, Sumatra, Borneo and Timor, bringing rice and pigs and pottery. Though originally animists who worshipped their ancestors, the islands of Indonesia eagerly absorbed the culture and spirituality of India, including Hinduism and Buddhism. One of the earliest Indonesian kingdoms was a Hindu one. The 7th century saw the rise of the Srivijaya kingdom on Sumatra, which gained considerable wealth and power from trade via its grip on the naval routes linking India to China. As you see, the Srivijaya artists were highly skilled. Of course, the presence of plenty always lures predators, and the state was handicapped by the invasion of Rajendra Chola and slowly declined thereafter. Meanwhile, on Java, we spot the ascent of the Medang Kingdom, whose mysterious Sailendra dynasty constructed the extraordinary Borobudur, the world's biggest Buddhist temple in the early 9th century. The Hindu Sanjaya dynasty followed and built Indonesia's biggest Hindu temple, the Prambanan. The Javanese were apparently so pleased with these architectural wonders that they built some more. A lot more. Then Mr. Marapi here erupted in the early 900s and put a stop to it all. Our focus now shifts to eastern Java, where the power subsequently concentrated. In the late 1200s, the Mongol Emperor of China sent emissaries to the island to demand tribute, but the Javanese disfigured the envoys and sent them packing, and I suspect they may have shouted, THIS IS JAVA! before kicking them out. Naturally, the Emperor was outraged and ordered a huge invasion. Enter Raden Wijaya. He cleverly allied with the invading Mongols to defeat a rival for the throne, after which he turned against the Mongols, who, while almost invincible on open plains, were more than a little inconvenienced in the thick, hot, dripping climate of Java. After two months of guerrilla warfare, the weary Mongols retreated, and Wijaya went on to establish the mighty Majapahit Empire, a majestic maritime mercantile power, like a sort of tropical Venice. It reached its apex under the king Hayam Wuruk and his talented prime minister Gajah Mada, and while the Hindu faith was currently very strong, Muslim merchants had consistently made sure to preach of Allah and his prophet Muhammad, and they did quite a job, for today Islam is the majority religion of Indonesia. So by the 1500s there were sultans and everything, but the islands of Indonesia with their valued spices caught the attention of Europe. The Portuguese were the first from that continent to settle in the islands and nuzzle into the trade, but their ambition to acquire the monopoly of commerce suffered a setback with the entrance of the Dutch, who by the early 1600s were already muscling the Portuguese out of ports and forts, though they could and expelled them from Eastern Timor. The first permanent Dutch settlement was Banten in Western Java, and they meant business in the fullest sense of the term, seen with the conquest of the Banda Islands by the merciless Jorn Pitoshon Kun. When the Sultan of Central Java, Agung of Mataram, set out and successfully conquered surrounding regions, he turned his attentions to the Dutch and besieged them twice, but without success. The Dutch elbowed the Portuguese out even more and invited Chinese workers to Batavia, present-day Jakarta. But relations became uneasy, and when, in 1740, Chinese sugar mill workers revolted and killed 50 Dutch soldiers, whispers circulated among the multi-ethnic citizens that the Chinese planned to kill them all. Chinese homes were burned, and it escalated into massacre, and some 10,000 Chinese were butchered under the eyes of Governor Adrian Folkenier, who was later arrested and died in prison. Now, while the Dutch East India Company had entrenched itself in the area, the cost of maintenance and administration and rebellion quashing drained away resources. Furthermore, corruption and competition 
competition from other powers like the British in India meant the company ended up bankrupt and was taken over by the Dutch government. After a brief time of French and British command, the Dutch regained control, crushed a rebellion led by Prince Dipon Akoro, and the governor, Johannes von den Bosch, instituted a forced labor system to increase revenue. There was war in Bali and in Borneo and the Aceh region of Sumatra, prompting the Achenese to declare jihad against the invaders, but to no avail, and the Dutch East Indies expanded, and as if to vent the region's frustrations, Krakatoa exploded in one of history's biggest and loudest volcanic eruptions. The Dutch continued to snap up more land till 1920, with the taking of Northwest New Guinea, and thus the Dutch East Indies attained its greatest extent. Though the Hollanders were introducing reforms and trinkets of modernity and extending education to the indigenous inhabitants, the future Indonesians never stopped fighting for freedom, and activists began promoting their ideas to the people, whilst forming political parties ranging from communist to Islamic based. Still, it was pretty clear that something very big would be needed to drive the Dutch out. And then something very big happened. World War II. The Japanese invaded Indonesia in 1942 and swiftly took control. And though Indonesians welcomed them as liberators, it soon became clear that the Japanese simply saw Indonesia as a good place to get stuff and supply their troops. The Japanese subjugated millions of Indonesians to forced labor and millions ended up dead. However, the Japanese interim gave the independence movement its needed boost. And after the Japanese surrender in 1945, Indonesia declared its independence with socialist Sukarno as first president. The Dutch were like, what? And there was a one guess war. That's right. It was an ugly, messy affair. But in 1949, the Netherlands finally agreed to relinquish its colonial claims and Indonesia was free, but not free from trouble. The country was a muddle of mixed ambitions, some pushing for secularism, others for an Islamic state. Sukarno struggled to instill a sense of unity, but as the economy faltered and as his sympathies veered closer to communism, the army in 1965 undertook a vicious purge of communists, slaughtering over half a million and then Sukarno Sukarno himself was ousted, and in 1967, General Suharto assumed power as a military dictator. However, since he was anti-communist, the West supported him during the Cold War, and Indonesia's economic standing improved, though corruption was rampant. In 1975, Portugal renounced its colony of East Timor, and Indonesia invaded and took over, much to the discontent of the East Timorese. Indonesian forces were accused of multiple human rights abuses, but still retained the political support of countries like the US, UK, Japan, and Australia. Australia. That is, until 1991, when the Santa Cruz massacre shocked the world, and when 1997's Asian financial crisis struck, Suharto's remaining legitimacy dissipated, and he resigned. East Timor gained independence in 2002, the same year as the horrific Bali bombings, where Islamists killed 202 people, mostly tourists. The country was then pounded by earthquake and tsunami, leaving over 100,000 people dead. In the years after, Indonesia enjoyed steady financial growth, and today has achieved a high level of human development. And the the world's 16th biggest economy, a fascinating country crammed with culture and delicious dishes and brilliant badminton players. That's Indonesia, and that's all from me for now. Bye bye. <laughs>